we are live, and today we are talking about the Rockahoo. I haven't read the papers, I've been working all day. 1991's The Rocketeer Review and Thoughts. So, I'm going to start by telling you, this was a movie I really loved. This video will have some jokes, and I will get into some serious topics. So, if you are looking for a review that is like, oh, the movie doesn't really hold up, it's been outdone by later movies, because of that, it's not really that much fun to watch today, and or it's different from the original, so it sucks, whether you agree with that assessment or not, this is not that review. I will go into some of the politics. So, I realize this video is long, I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. I start the video with a review, most likely with zero spoilers. If I spoil anything, I will warn before I do so and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoilers. You can mute and skip hand to see me lower my index finger. As soon as I end the review itself, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers, both for the movie and the original graphic novel that it's based on, and I will be discussing the ending. Now, the movie is rated PG, and so is this video, and let's see, the, yeah, you know, there's a little language, and there is some violence, the, the violence is not very, very harsh, so yeah, PG rating makes a lot of sense, it's not quite G rated, but it is not so much that it, because this is, you know, the PG-13 rating, I believe was 19, uh, hmm. I, okay, I believe 1984 was when the PG-13 rating was introduced, and yeah, um, so, so yes, this movie could have been rated PG-13, I think it makes good sense that it doesn't. Now, I streamed this movie and thus didn't pay anything extra to watch it, so anything negative I say in this video, which there's probably not going to be very much of, it's not out of bitterness. I don't feel like the movie wasted my time. Nobody forced me to watch it or to make this video. And I'm not upset at how it compares, uh, compares to the graphic novel or similar movies. The negative, to the best of my ability, the negative things I say in this are fair criticisms based on budget, when it came out, what it was trying to achieve, etc. Now, that pretty much... Yes, so I have watched this once. And I got done watching, like, I think 15 minutes before I started recording this. And, yeah, so, the, yes, yeah, so, the plot. This is set in 1938 in Los Angeles, California, and, yeah, our protagonist is stunt pilot Cliff Secord, and he discovers a hidden rocket-powered jetpack, and, yeah, let's see. So, yeah, the, but there are people looking for, you know, this, this rocket pack. Yeah, that works. And the, let's see, yeah, so, let's see, the, and there we go. <clears throat> so, the, yeah, there's, this movie is not as widely known as a lot of the ones that I do videos on, so I'm just going to briefly compare, there's definitely some similarities, you know, this was made by Joe Johnston, who later directed, and, and this was basically, this is definitely a big part of why he later was hired to direct the first Captain America movie. Now, that movie has gotten a lot of hatred. I think 
well, you know, I suppose maybe not as much hatred as just indifference, and you know, a lot of people place it fairly low on the ranking of the MCU movies. I think with both of these movies, basically, a lot of people weren't really expecting what they got, and unfortunately in today's society, a lot of people, if we get... I, I try to be above it, but even I sometimes, if we get something that wasn't what we expected, instead of just trying to adapt and saying, well, you know, that's kind of interesting, let's see if it's well done, a lot of people just say, oh, I didn't like it, so it must be bad. But yeah, um, so, th you know, this movie, th think Captain America the First Avenger with a much smaller budget and scope. Or something like uh, the first Sam Raimi Spider-Man movie. But, um, let's see, I guess, yeah, there are, um, I suppose, smaller scale than that. And, yeah, you know, that, that kind of thing. Um, and, yeah, on, on Disney+, Plus, this is compared to, uh, uh, the suggested section on Disney+, Plus has, there we go, Tomorrowland National Treasure 2, Tron Legacy, which, you know, I, to me, Tron Legacy is a 7 out of 10, Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Man's Chest, Tuck Everlasting, John Carter, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, which I would probably give about an 8 out of 10. Mandalorian Season 1, uh, actually, yeah, just The Mandalorian, I would rate both Season 1 and 2 a 10 out of 10. And the, the ones I didn't mention votes for are ones I haven't watched and am not currently planning on watching. So big part of why I decided to do this movie. You know, there's a lot of Disney Plus movies that I think, oh, you know, that's maybe somewhat interesting, but I end up not deciding to do. This one, it's in part because I really, really like Joe Johnston. Like, uh, yeah, most of what I've seen by him, I really, really like. And yeah, it's just, it's fascinating to me that there was this like you can you can really understand why you know the this helped him get the job for the first Captain America movie and why ultimately it you know I think that is the only MCU movie he has directed and yeah this really works as let's see uh an audition audition tape you know feature length audition tape but it it has value beyond that you know, it's only really the first Captain America movie of of the entire MCU so far that has that kind of feel of this, you know, late 30s or 1940s possibly kind of, you know, and and really trying to, to a certain extent, recreate what it was like back then, but also filtering it through this old serial kind of look you know this if you didn't know any better like if you watch this and you haven't watched you and you're not familiar with the the people like you know i know what um these actors looked like in 1991 but if i if you showed this to someone who is used to watching serials from the 30s and 40s they might think, oh, wow, I, I thought I had watched all the serials, but here's one I must have missed, you know, it legitimately. And, and that's, like, a lot of the negative reviews. I'm not going to claim that it's perfect, but a lot of the negative reviews just weren't really up for that. And, I, yeah, that's fine, you know, if it's not for you. I just don't think it makes a lot of sense to, to do a negative review of something that's well made but not for you you know I, I feel like negative reviews that that's f you you know Uwe Boll you know deserves negative reviews I you know I've watched the house of the dead it is garbage and not fun garbage either you know I can understand why some people enjoy I I 
there there can you can have some fun you know with with certain bad movies just watching them you know that's part of what mystery science theater 3000 is all about you know having fun while watching something that let's be honest is probably you know the movies tend to be pretty bad um but that's not you know Uwe Boll, I, I don't think I've watched more than The House of the Dead. That's, frankly, I'd, someone who would actually attach... Like, he didn't Alan Smithy it, you know? He attached his name to it. I really don't have any faith that he can recover, that he would ever become a talented director after watching that. I think it makes a lot of sense to give negative reviews to his movies, and I really don't think... I, I would not recommend watching The House of the Dead. Uh, watch someone play the House of the Dead instead. It'll be much more fun. Now, let's see. But but yeah, you know, I was I, I'm really happy that I gave this a chance. So that brings us to yeah. So if you're not aware, the character originated in the 1930s, like Buck Rogers, one of the inspirations for Star Wars, and yeah, you know, 20 years later, Joe Johnston got to do the first Captain MCU Captain America movie. Not the first Captain America movie, sadly, but the first good one, I, I hear. I haven't watched the other ones, but I don't think that's at all something that I'm interested in. I will not be talking about the Disney Junior animated version. I'm glad it exists. I can definitely imagine small children loving this character. I just don't review children's animation. I'm really glad that the lead is a girl. For way too long, there haven't been enough heroes for girls. And very cool to connect it to this. It's not just the same concept. And yeah, I definitely think that, you know, you could... With the, with the right people, you could make a sequel... Or I guess a remake, but I'm not sure a remake is necessary. Like, yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's too far down the line from, you know, the movie's 31 years old. Well, uh, what's what's the nostalgia gap again? I think it's more than. Oh wait, it is it 30? I think it is 30. Yeah, in the 80s they made they they were nostalgic for the 50s, and in the 2010s they were nostalgic for the 80s so yeah maybe it would make sense to to make you know it's it's still disney you know they 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 love nothing more these days than to milk every last little bit out of their previously established titles so yeah but actually yeah i i think i will just very briefly say the yeah in case you don't yourself look up the you know this movie or the the animated the thing with the animated is that Billy Campbell plays Cliff Secord in let's see I want to say it's it you know in in this I believe also in that huh is it really not? Oh, there it is. Yeah. Oh, huh. Dave's Accord. Instead of... Cliff. Ah, uh, okay, so possibly a different... Yeah, is it maybe that he plays his own... One of his own um, descendants, maybe? But, but yeah, very cool. You know, not something that they absolutely had to do. Oh, wow, very diverse cast. But, but yeah, um, and it's about maybe his great-granddaughter or something, Kit Secord. But, but yeah, um, I, I quite like, that's a, that's, you know, and, and like, I don't know, I mean, I, I feel like um, Billy Campbell is one of those, like, his career never took off the way that, like, some of his peers did, you know, like, in his youth, you know, like, to me, he's Jordan Collier from the 4400, but, yeah, when he made this, you know, you could see him turning into a leading man, and that never quite happened for him the way that other, you know, yeah, other young men from the, the who were making big, you know, because this was a, 
it's not the biggest movie ever, but it was something that people, you know, yeah, it, it, it's not an indie movie or something, so, but, yeah. It, I, I like that he returned for the, yeah. And, uh, let's see, yeah. Once again, the, the, I think it makes a lot of sense to do a sequel uh, to, to this. And basically, I don't know, uh, I guess maybe there's not that much nostalgia these days for the 1930s. Maybe make it his son and set it a couple decades later. Or, or make it the, you know grand-grandchild, great-great-grandchild, and, and the, ah, uh, yeah, anyway, so, starting with the writing, so, Dave Stevens, R.I.P., is credited for, yeah, the, the graphic novel, The Rocketeer, and he was born in 1955, so to him, the 1930s, wasn't that long before he was a kid, you know, and yeah, it's, it's, there's a lot of, of people who love making, you know, who, who are, who work in entertainment in, in some form or another, who try to make movies and, con in this case, comic books and, and so on and so forth for a time that is either their childhood or not, you know, yeah, not long before their childhood kind of thing. You know, I, I can imagine, like, maybe his his father probably remembered the 30s and maybe told him stuff, you know, something like that. And, I it, yeah, Dave Stevens, I, I read the, the graphic novel. It is very well done. Um, it is, you know, if you like the movie, you might like the, the comic. If you just like comic books, it might not be for you. Um... Yeah, again, you know, it is very much a, a period piece, and this kind of, it has the, the serial feel. And, yeah, so, Paul DeMeo, R.I.P., is credited with the story and screenplay, and William Deere is credited with the story. And they've written lots of other cool genre flicks, and you can really see how, the, yeah... And Danny Bilson is credited with the story and screenplay, and he and Paul DeMeo wrote other stuff together... And, let's see, yeah, I gotta say, I am not particularly familiar with these, um, yeah, I'll briefly go over, so, 2020, The Five Bloods, 1991's Transfers 2, but only characters and uncredited, 89's Arena, 88's Pulse Pounders, character segment Transfers 2, written by Transfers 2. <clears throat> 88's The Wrong Guys, 86's Eliminators, 85's Zone Troopers, and 84's Transfers. So that's, yeah. Uh, let's see. And he's written some TV, including... The Flash. Huh. Oh, you know, 90 to 91, not the, not the more recent one. And, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Oh, wow. There's six Transfers movies. And he has a character's writing for all... Yeah. And three through six are direct-to-video. Yeah. Uh, let's see, so the, and he also wrote the short, Transfer City of Lost Angels, so, yeah, but yeah, you can definitely tell that there is the, the, you know, yeah, this, this thing of a, you know, the, the comic book sensibility, and yeah, so Paul DeMeo, Oh, he wrote 11 video games, um, including a golden eye, but not that golden eye. Not, not the Nintendo 64 golden eye. Darksiders 2, Metro Last Light. Yeah, he's, he's, 
written some really solid. I haven't played those video games, but they are very highly rated. And he wrote Command and Conquer Generals, which still my favorite Command and Well, General Zero Hour is my absolute favorite, but yeah, my absolute favorite Command and Conquer game. One of my favorite real-time strategy games, so yeah, very, very cool. And yeah, so William Deere wrote the story and 16 theatrical movies total as far back as 1973. As recent as 2021. So, yeah, this, the, the, um, let's see, I wrote something here about the, the writing. So, basically, yeah, this is a very, like, the, the script is tremendously economical. This movie does not overstay its welcome, but it's not so short that it doesn't make an impression either. Every line, scene, and major character contributes to the plot, the characterization, the world building, like everything, you, like, I defy you to write the name of a character or a scene that in the in the comment section that doesn't in some way contribute to the the overall yeah and the, the this uh, it it's it gives really great introductions to the various, let's see, all oh, right. Uh, yeah, every major character, object, location gets a strong entrance. Like, nothing is just, oh, there's that. Everything, like, most of the major characters, I, I think there's one where it's the second scene, but the rest of them, the first time you meet them, they will say or do something that really defines who they are. So you immediately get a sense of who they are. And that's actually, this doesn't really have the modern plot twists that we're used to. And I realize, you know, okay, so 1991, but even back then there were movies that had much more twisty, turny plots than these, you know, yeah. As an example, the, the James Bond movies, contain, you know, more modern plot twists, because they're supposed, you know, is every James Bond movie supposed to be set when it came out, or, you know, r roughly, you know, and this was a 1991 movie set in 1938, so, yeah, and it has a very classic feel, and, yeah, these are things that have really put some viewers off, and for sure, like, if you don't think that, you, it's for you, you know, like, yeah, based on, you know, I'm going to try to to speak to the, the various aspects of it in, throughout this video. If by the end of this review, you don't think that it's for you, honestly, you know, <laughs> either I will have done a very bad job with this video, or it just isn't for you. And that's, that's fine. That's not... You know that doesn't say that doesn't suggest something bad about you or the people making it. You know, that's just yeah. It it is. It is one hundred percent what it wants to be. You know, I, I, yeah. The, there are some traits where it, you know, it does try to include. Like well, yeah, it does include things that you would expect to appeal to different, you know, yeah, different audience. Yeah, uh, I forget what they're called, but the different groups of audiences, you know, the, the kids will think it's funny, the adults, you know, might find it nostalgic or, you know, just really look to it as something that helps say some things that a lot of, a lot of people feel, 
you know, stereotypically speaking, maybe the, the women in the audience will like the romance stuff, you know, so, yeah. And some of the humor could have been in an MCU movie, but it isn't trying to be anywhere near as fast. And again, I get, I get you know, the, this and the first MCU movie were 17 years apart. Things have changed. I get that. But, you know, at the same time, like, the MCU isn't quite the same as Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight trilogy. You know, there are differences. And... Yeah, yeah, I think I would say, you know, in some ways, this is close. This definitely bears some, some resemblance to Batman Begins. Now, the, that brings us to the direction. So, this, yes, Joe Johnston directed this, and, oh, he's doing a new Chronicles of Narnia. I could, I could see that, I could see him doing that. A movie called Shrunk, which I guess there's some chance it has to do with the... Honey, I Shrunk the Kids? Uh, yeah, anyway. The Nutcracker and the Four Realms. Not safe work. And then... Yeah, I'll, I'll briefly tell him, you know, he did Hidalgo, Jurassic Park 3, which I know is one of the more hated ones. October Sky. And then the ones that I have watched, so Captain America the First Avenger from 2011, which I rank an 8 out of 10. 20 Tones the Wolfman, which I rank a 5 out of 10. Like I said, I don't love everything he's done. Jumanji, which I rate an 8 out of 10. Really, the only thing about that movie is it doesn't hide the effects, and the effects didn't even look that good at the time, but that was the 90s, you know. Some movies were completely ruined by it. I don't think Jumanji is one of those. I think the, the character relationships really stand the test of time. And so does a lot of the acting. And he directed the live action sequences for the 1994 movie The Page... Right. That's the old Jumanji. The, the 1995 Jumanji. I'm not talking about the new ones. I haven't watched them. 1994's Page Master. He directed the live action sequences. And I would say that movie is about 7 out of 10. And Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, so the original, not the sequels, 1989, and I would also rank that an 8 out of 10. Oh, right, yeah, I think I did mention that earlier. Anyway, but, but yeah, um, and he has three TV, uh, three, yeah, three credits as director of TV stuff, including... Young Indiana Jones, but that was after this. That does make a lot of sense. And... Oh, yeah, yeah, all of the... Let's see. Yeah, yeah, he directed two episodes of... Oh, different Young Indiana Jones shows. And a 2015 TV movie called Lumen... He also directed a direct video, yeah, as a segment of the direct video Indiana Jones movie from 1990, Spring Break Adventure. Wow. And other than that, he is responsible for visual effects. He, you know, he was the art director for Star Wars. All yeah, all three of the original uh, trilogy, the 1978 Battlestar Galactica. And Indiana Jones, Raiders of the Lost Ark. And, yeah, he apparently, like, created some really, you know, he, well, yeah, yeah, art director. He created some of these, the, the vehicles that, you know, absolutely, that, that everybody remembers from some of the Star Wars movies. So, creative guy, you know. And he was actually only 27 when he did, you know, visual effects on the original Star Wars. So, yeah. You know, that basically, he's been, he's been working in movies. You know, he wasn't always directing movies, but he's been working, you know, he's been doing something really, really creative and important for movies since then. So, he really impressed people on that movie, and it's no one, you know... Th like, holy crap, I would not have been able to handle a Star Wars movie when I was 27. Uh, let's see. Yeah. And 
Right, so yeah, ranking the movies of his that I've watched worst to best. The Wolfman, The Page Master, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, Jumanji, and Captain America, The First Avenger. Right, worst to best other than this. I will let you know what I rate, wh where this one fits in the ranking. Let's see. Yes, by the end of the review itself. And yeah, so... <sighs> Worst to best of similar, again, not counting this one. Let's see. Sky Captain, Indiana Jones 2, Batman 89, Iron Man 1, The Shadow, and Dark Man. It's, the movie is very aw shucks. And yeah, one critic pointed out, it's like 1978 Superman and 2002 Spider-Man like that. Very earnest. And, you know, pop culture for youths in the 90s were all about being gritty, edgy, edgy, including maybe especially in comic books and comic book movies. This was the decade of Spawn, Venom, Sin City. It was just a few years too late. Honestly, if the comic had been adapted just a tiny bit sooner, but then it was already adapted pretty quickly after the com you know the comic was published in 1982 it language and development heck for years you know other than that it would really have come out sooner and yeah i th i think the 80s would have been much more welcoming of this but yeah you know this came out 2 years after the 89 batman movie yeah um like it's not that I'm, I'm sure there were probably teenagers and 20-somethings that did really dig this movie when it came out, but they probably were afraid to tell anyone of their peers because they were afraid that they would get laughed at, you know. So that, yeah, that was an issue for, for this where, yeah, you know, the 1978 Bat Superman, yeah, you know, it, it, it's charming. It's, I'm, I'm not going to be criticizing that movie here. It, you know, it came out at a good time for that kind of thing. And yeah, I, I can understand why there's still people today who think that movie is amazing. You know, it's, let's see, I was thinking, uh, do I have, oh yeah, yeah. You know, I'm not saying that I'm above, I own a copy of it, you know, it's VHS, so not watching it much these days, but yeah, you know, there's, there's some, that, that was a, there we go, there we go, that, that was a good time to, to put out something like this, you know, people were still w welcoming towards this very earnest thing and yeah as far as i understand the the comic in 1982 was also popular you know it, it found an audience at the very least and yeah um so so yeah it's it's too bad it, it really would have if it had just come out you know yeah at some point during during the 80s, before 89 Batman, you know, I, I was, I feel like, wasn't uh, Phantom, was that not also, uh, uh, not, not the, not the musical, I mean the, oh yeah, that's all, huh, yeah, um, the Phantom came out in 1996, I'm not saying that movie is quite as good as this. Uh, I think I only watched it the once. Yeah, yeah, a lot of people have given it a 5 out of 10 on IMDb. That makes a lot of sense to me. Um, but, but yeah, you know, that was maybe also a little too... Or wait, does... I forget, does... Is that one maybe a little grittier and less earnest than this one? I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but yeah. 
Uh, let's see. Yeah, development for this movie started as far back as 1983 when Steven sold the film rights to the character Steve Miner and William Deere considered directing The Rocketeer before Johnston signed on. Steve Miner? Steve Miner, director of House and... Uh, I know he did some... Halloween H2O Friday the 13th 2 th and 3 Okay, maybe it's not so bad that it came out a little later. Holy crap. I would not have been very interested in the Steve Miner version of this. Like I'm not obviously there's a huge difference between this and those slasher movies, but okay, he did a he did an okay job on the second Friday the 13th movie, but those are really not particularly good uh, slasher movies. Even, you know, that, yeah, I've, I could mention a lot of slasher movies that are substantially better, you know. So, so yeah, he was directing slasher movies in 81 and 82, you know. 84 saw the first Nightmare on Elm Street movie. That is, you know, much, much better than the... Anyway. And... Let's see... Yeah, screenwriters Danny Bilson and Paul DeMeo had creative differences with Disney, causing the film to languish in development heck. It also came up against Terminator 2, a sequel some people waited seven years for, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles live action and theatrical, both for the first time, Robin Hood Prince of Thieves, the first Robin Hood in a while, especially live action, you don't have to like those three, but they were definitely more gritty and edgy than what a lot of teens had seen before and for Turtles and Robin Hood than we'd seen in earlier adaptations. Like, I... At the end of the day, I probably would rather watch the 1987 Saturday morning cartoon of Turtles, but I'm not going to claim that... At least the early seasons of that are not as gritty as the first movie. Like, some people forget the language in the first Turtles movie, which, you know... Yeah, it was a bit more than, you know, and, and a bunch of parents got really mad, and that's why the, you know, I think both two and three are much, much, you know, lighter, and, and yeah. But, yeah, these are, these are, this, this was not a good time to be releasing this movie compared to, you know, if this movie had been, like, specifically aimed at, like, you know, people aged third. Let's see, let's say thirty-five and up. Well, that might have been fine because, like I mentioned, you know, those movies. Well, the, the Terminator Two, you can watch that. You know, if you're an adult, but maybe and and Robin Hood. There's something for pretty much everyone in that movie. But the Turtles movie, that was what you know, kids and teenagers wanted to see at that time. Uh, you know, well, actually, yeah, the teenagers probably preferred. Terminator, but, but yeah, you know, this was, this was not the right time, and let's see, yeah, in 2011, when Joe Johnson did the first MCU Captain America film, we already knew that we were interested in the MCU, the MCU was the new big thing in comic book movies, so it being a 1940s story was more acceptable to audiences, you know, yeah, 2011, like, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure it's necessarily... The, the, um, let's see, the, the, yeah, in, in 2011, it was, we, you know, we were, yeah, before the movie, before Captain America, the first Avenger came out, I don't think, I'm, I'm not sure anybody was a, even a little bit unclear. We all knew after that one, there's going to be an Avengers movie. So, yeah, it's like, ah, okay, 1940s, whatever. It's two hours, whatever. You know, who, who's going to miss the first Captain America movie before the first Avengers movie, which where, where Captain America is going to be a major character, you know? So, yeah. And, and this, it wasn't really like... 
I think if it had done well, it could have gotten a sequel just a couple of years later. But yeah, now it's you know so the 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 um um. There we go. The the more recent Rocketeer movie, other uh, show, was 2019-2020. So, yeah. And, right, so, some critic quotes. The movie's always going back and forth between silliness and tension, but it works. 100% agreed. And, let's see. Um... Yeah, one person says it is so frustrating that every time the movie should finally take off, it cuts away to a story that drags it to a halt. I see what they mean, but and and for sure, like that is something that is going to bother people. And it's not really, it's not, it's not an incorrect um, statement, basically. But uh, yeah, I, I yeah, it'll bother some people. It really didn't bother me. And, yeah, one person said, when the afterburners are on, unless they're made of fireproof fiber, his pants should be on fire. Are you calling him a liar? No self-irony. It believes in its own premise and is all the better for it. And, let's see. Hmm. Okay, yeah, uh, I do. I don't agree with the following, but it is something that some have said, and I can, you know, ag again, it, at least it's not just, it's boring, so, yeah. Somewhere in here is a film lacking in soul. I don't know if it's the actors, the writing, the direction, they certainly put the effort into it, and there's no reason not to enjoy the film, but somehow Indiana Jones and Star Wars grab you on the inside, and this one sits outside and just shows pretty colors. The production is so slick and well done, it's a pleasure to watch. You could get a lot less out of a movie, but when they put so much effort into making it look so good, it should feel good too. Funny movie alchemy. And... Let's see. Yeah, some some think some feel that there you know there's too much going on in the plot, so it takes too long to get going. There's too little jetpack action. Again, I I understand where they're coming from, and it definitely is like I th I feel like a sequel would have had a lot more jetpack action, but yeah, I, I liked that there's so much going on in the plot. Uh, the movie is in too much of a rush, so some ideas and themes aren't explored. M maybe, yeah. Joe Johnson is an economic storyteller. He wastes no time. And Captain America 1 is like a spiritual successor to this. Now, the opening of this movie is quite strong. Like, we are very... We, we meet Cliff... And not long, and and we're you know we get why, like he's he's going to, um. I guess it's a test run. I think that's what it is. He's going to do a test run on a plane, and it's you know it's a really big deal for for him and Peavy, his mentor, and not long after we're intro we we see that. There's something important that involves the cops, the FBI, some thieves that we don't know exactly who right, from right away, and there's this mystery item that the thieves are trying to get away, you know, yeah. And, yeah, that is that is what I would say for and And, yeah, it does a really good job setting up, like... Not every movie needs to do this, but it can be really, really good if basically you can set up the entire movie in, like, the first little chunk of the movie. And, yeah, this movie does a really great job of that. Like, there's there's fleshing out in the rest of the movie. It's not like... And you're not going to be able to see everything coming or anything. But, yeah, basically, like, you know... And in a way, like, like I mentioned, it's... PG, you know, so essentially 
any child can watch it just you know they're they're saying to parents you know there might be some stuff in here but but yeah you know if you're not too scared of your eight-year-old repeating some of the language you know yeah they could they could follow it you know and they would they would walk away with a, a moral and like yeah you know they'd be they'd laugh at it they they might want to they, they might want a toy of of the rocketeer and you know just yeah so you know for that kind of thing it's it's not terrible of an idea to make it a, a relatively, you know, I, I would argue that the, the, if every, like, there's a lot of developments of the plot, but you can pick it all up in a single viewing. You know, it's, it's not the kind of thing where afterwards you have to sit down and piece together. No, you can, you know, every time something happens in the plot, like, it might take a little while. Some, sometimes there are mysteries that, you know, there's there's one major mystery that's only really completely uh, revealed relatively close to the end. But other than that, like, yeah, you'll pretty quickly be able, you know, like, there are, there are several times in this where one or more characters will show up to a place and you know maybe they'll be a threat to the hero maybe they can help the hero but you know there's it's important for the plot that they show up and each time you know it, it, like maybe like there's one there's one or two where i was like wait does that mean and you know like i'd say within 30 seconds i understood how that came you know cuz each time like you'll see them realize oh if we go there that's where you know there there's something really important there so when you see them get there you know yeah and and yeah so i'm not going to give away whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending but if it's with what came before i i i really really like how the movie ends it does not rely on deus ex machina other convenient writing like everything in the movie is set up. There's nothing that just comes out of completely out of left field. Which today, like, there's I'm I'm not saying that that's necessarily bad, but today we have a lot of movies where something will suddenly happen, and it's you know it it's it's meant to surprise us. And I'm not saying it doesn't necessarily make sense. They they you know good movies good recent movies do try to explain it. But I think there's something I'm, – I'm glad that a movie like this could get made in 1991, you know, because I do think, like, when – you know, every so often I'll re-watch an older movie uh, – old um, – a not very recent movie, and I just – there's some things that used to be tried and true – and now, like, a lot of filmmakers have basically abandoned them. And I just, I'm, I'm glad that, you know, like, if you agree with my review, like, depending on where in the world you are, you might be able to go on Disney Plus and watch it right after, you know. So, yeah, the, the, I've, I'm, I'm glad that it's still possible to, to watch, at least. I, I don't know if... Very many are getting made like this. And, yeah, like, the climax of this movie was really, really great. And and really, like, it, it pays off on a number of things set up over the course of the film. Yeah, you know, it's not gonna... It's not as big as some people would like it to be. And, you know, yeah, so I just mentioned, I, I honestly, I don't remember that much of the climax of the first Turtles movie. It's been years since I watched it. I'm not sure I watched it more than once. But Terminator 2 and Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, they do have bigger climax, climactic scenes than this. And I got to admit, also more complex ones, uh, trading in more complex themes and ideas than this one but you know that is part of this movie's charm 
and uh, let's see. Yeah, so I, you know, I recommend reading the original graphic novel. It's very entertaining, great art, artwork and writing. And honestly, this is a very direct adaptation for a lot of it. Like, it adds some action scenes and characterization because the movie has more time to do so. And it adjusts certain things in, in my opinion, satisfying ways. Uh, let's see. Yeah, you know... In, in the book, we're told that the usual plane they use is not in great shape, but in the movie, we see something happens happen that leads to that in an action scene, which it explains it in an exciting and visual way. And, yeah, you know, um, I'd say it takes maybe half a minute per page, and there's only 56 pages, so, yeah, you can knock it out in one sitting. And there, there is some stuff in the comic that isn't at all in the movie. So, yeah, if you really like the movie and you want more like it, I do recommend reading the graphic novel. And if you already read the graphic novel and you want something close to an adaptation of it, you know, you're going to notice some stuff that's not in the movie. In my opinion, the, the changes made and the, the stuff that they omitted makes sense. There's nothing that they just didn't do just because, ah, oh, that looks like a lot of work. I don't want to do that much work. No, it's it's because they felt that it wouldn't work as well in the movie. And, yeah. Now, the... Yeah, so the, the characters are archetypes in, in some way. They're not the most complex... And, again, that is part of the appeal. You know, if you sh Again, you can show this to an eight-year-old, and afterwards, they're not going to be super confused, which, like, you know, I don't know if, if people are taking eight-year-olds to MCU movies, but, yeah, like, you know, yeah, certainly uh, Thor, um, Thor Love and Thunder, for sure, there is a lot of child-friendly material in that movie, but I, I could definitely imagine some kids walking out of that one and being like, wait, how, what was that, you know? And, you know, maybe with that kind of thing, like, I'm sure Disney wouldn't exactly mind if the kid was like, I gotta watch, Dad, can you take me to watch that again? You know, because Mom's gonna say no, because she's the boring one, stereotypically speaking. But yeah, um, it is definitely, yeah, I just, I, I really appreciate that about this movie, but... Yeah, so Billy Campbell plays Cliff Secord the Rocketeer, and yeah, I know him from the Free Four Hundred. He right, he's also in Enough, which I forget. Did I? Yeah, I think I might mention that. It, right, right, yeah. And he plays Quincy P. Morris in the nineteen ninety two Bram Stoker's Dracula. I gotta admit, he's probably the of of the of the young white men in that movie. He's probably the one I remember the least. Well, that's because I know Keanu Reeves. Yeah, Keanu Reeves was in Bram Stoker's Dracula. It's pretty wild, and not as like just an extra cameo either. He has this important role. But but yeah, you know, there's the then then there's I don't know if you want to call you want to say that Anthony Hopkins was young at that time. But yeah, there's there's him. And, yeah, anyway, you know, I I would say Billy Campbell is good in, you know, all four of these roles. You know, essentially my only major problem with the movie Enough is it should just be a music video. Like, you really don't need an entire movie for Jennifer Lopez is being physically abused by her husband. She trains physically in order to be able to take him on, and they fight. That shouldn't be a movie. That should be a music video. I even have an idea for what female singer could have performed the song and played the role in the music video. You might be able to guess who I'm referring to. Let's see. And, and you know, I mean, if you're going to watch a Jennifer Lopez, you know, a, a movie that has Jennifer Lopez in it, I'd recommend you turn over enough. Yeah. Now, let's see. Yeah, so some critic quotes about... Billy Campbell, he lacks star quality and charisma. He's not Harrison Ford. The lead should have been played by Timothy Dalton. I do think Timothy Timothy Dalton is 
just amazing in his role in this. So I'm glad that he... But, but for sure, Timothy Dalton has more charisma than Billy Campbell. Cliff is relatable and accessible because he's not a flawless superhero. He screws up now and then. For example, as he's getting used to using the jetpack. And yeah, Campbell, he's the brother of Bruce Campbell. And some say he's a bit like Brendan Fraser. Um, yeah, I suppose there's... Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. There's some... Um, yeah. And I, I do... I, I, I really, really like Bruce Campbell. I don't think he would have worked as well in, in this. Because he is living the journeyman life of a flyer, scrimping and penny-pinching to keep himself in spare parts and fuel, he can't take his girl out anywhere but to the same old places, in security constantly gnawing at him every time she talks about her successful Hollywood friends. If any major character flaw saves Cliff from Gary Stewism, it's his fundamental misunderstanding of what Jenny wants and expects from him. He dreams of bringing home the bread for her as a nationally recognized flyer, knows that dream is farther off than ever before, and expresses his insecurity about this by verbally crapping on her professional aspirations. Christopher Reeve was never much of an actor, but darn it, he was Superman. He just fit that one or dual role perfectly. Bill Campbell is not much of an actor either, but unlike Reeves, he doesn't own this role one bit. He's boring and nondescript, something no superhero actor should ever be. I mean, I know not everyone loved Michael Keaton as Batman. I did. But Keaton at least brought some mystery, dark intensity, and aloofness, some personality to a superhero. Even Reeves had some charm at the very least. Campbell has nothing and brings little. And Johnston's obvious attempt at finding another Christopher Reeve is a big failure and crucial flaw in the film. Sorry, Joe, maybe you should have cast Bruce Campbell instead. Yeah, for sure that's some, how some people feel. And, and definitely, he is not the most you know interesting leading man. I think if more of the movie was just him, then it would be. But he has such excellent supporting cast. Now, but, but yeah, for sure, Christopher Reeves is the... the yeah. And I, I do like Michael Keaton's Batman as well. And and better than this. So, um, yeah, IMDb Trivia says that Michael Keaton, Alec Baldwin, Robin Williams, Mel Gibson, Harrison Ford, Ron Perlman, and Tom Hanks were considered to play Cliff. So, yeah, the, the Michael Keaton, that must have been before Batman. But yeah, this was in production heck for a while. Oh, Alec Baldwin, I think, is amazing in the shadow. So, at, um, yeah, uh, I think the the rest of them probably could have done, and and certainly Robin Williams and Tom Hanks would have brought more charm and and charisma to the role. But but yeah. Um, He's just interesting enough. He's he's not like edgy, but he's not flawless either. You know, he's not quite, he's not a he's not a Frank Miller character, but he's not just like you know the the Christopher Reeve as Superman was basically flawless. Like you know, if you were to say that he has a flaw. I guess maybe he's too trusting, and then there's, of course, Kryptonite, but yeah, you know, that was completely supposed to be someone to look up to, not someone to, like, recognize in yourself. Like, I, I, I think Superman, is, you know, no one can quite be him, but we can all aspire to be like him, and yeah, Cliff Secord. A lot of us could be, honestly. Like, you know, there's there's some aspects where we couldn't. But, yeah, you know, he's he's good at what he does. He's not flawless. He is, uh, you know, yeah. And, let's see. You know, the, uh, yeah, I already mentioned that there's this, you know, something happens that explains why the, the plane is not in completely great condition and yeah 
um, when Cliff flies, he puts a picture of his girlfriend, Jenny Blake, in, uh, you know, in the uh, cockpit. I, th I forget if they outright say, but like, probably a, a good luck thing, kind of, you know, so she's always with him kind of thing. And when the, the plane is like, in, you know, in bad shape and, and might be dangerous to be near, after leaving it, he runs back and grabs the picture of, of Jenny, which, you know, right there, just, you know, you understand that he is, yeah, he's willing to endanger himself even for a picture of her. So, you know, there's, yeah. Yeah, I think if if not for his relation, if they had made him be single, or if they weren't, yeah, or or if it's like you know in the first Spider-Man movie, Peter, you know, likes Mary Jane, is maybe even in love with her, but he isn't with her at least when the movie starts. I'm not gonna give away whether it happens during the movie, and yeah, you know, I'm I'm really glad that here. They made the very specific choice that from right away, you know, they are together. And basically, yeah, he wants to make her happy. And that's about, it, it, yeah, you know, basically there's that and then there's making money so that it's not, you know, because basically, like, if he can't, um, yeah, if things don't go well for him when he flies, you know, he might not have enough money. Like, he he might... Ah, uh, let me think. I think they said... Yeah, yeah. Um, fairly early on, they say that they can't... You know, they're, they're basically... They, they can't afford to, to make up for... Yeah. So, that brings us to Jennifer Connelly as Jenny Blake. Now, Jennifer Connelly is incredibly talented, and it's really, it's a shame that she doesn't have a lot of heavy lifting to do here, like she does in A Beautiful Mind, Requiem for a Dream, for example. It's a real waste of her time and considerable charm, but her charm and integrity do very clearly come through, so, yeah. And, let's see... Um... Yeah, so, um, I do not like to speak ill of the dead, but I am briefly going to talk about, basically, in the, in the book, Cliff does not have a lot of patience or empathy for Jenny, and neither does the book itself. It's very fictional woman written by a guy who thinks women are sexy, but otherwise doesn't have positive feelings for them. And it's telling that the art of the book sexualizes her and none of the men. Like, it's not like, you know, I'm not into guys, but yeah, you know, Cliff Secord, whether on the page or in the film, you know, tradition conventionally attractive, so, you know, but yeah. Women in the first collection book are either hot and obnoxious, but sometimes sweet, or not hot and obnoxious. And the movie treats her and the other female characters, yeah. A, at least a bit better and it's it's very clear in the movie that Cliff really doesn't mean to make her he's not intentionally you know crapping on her professional aspirations it's just that he doesn't really yeah his, his insecurity comes to the, the forefront there and yeah now um, yeah so according to IMDb trivia yeah, I think, uh, honestly, all of these could have done a, a good job as well. I, I wouldn't say that they're all as good actresses as... There we go. They're not all quite as talented as Jennifer Connelly herself. Um, I am just really quickly going to double check. Do I have that right? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, 
According to IMDb trivia, others that were considerate for the role of Jenny Blake include Sherilyn Fenn, Kelly Priston, RIP, Diane Lane, Elizabeth McGovern, who had played an older version of a Connolly character in Once Upon a Time in America seven years prior, and Penelope Ann Miller were considered... Yeah. And, yeah, for, you know, for sure, Diane Lane and Elizabeth McGovern, tremendously talented. I don't think I've seen Sherilyn Fenn, Penelope Ann Miller... In enough to really form an opinion, but yeah, and and you know, I I realize that the the you know a lot of the best work of Jennifer Connelly came after this. I'm I'm not asking them to be able to you know look in, into the future somehow. Um, let's see. Before this, um. Yeah, I, I hear her acting isn't good in Labyrinth. I I think she's very, very promising in Once Upon a Time in America. She has some complex emotions to play, and she does them quite well. I do not remember her in Phenomena. I, I think I only watched Phenomena once. The, the uh, Argento movie. Um... Yeah, I, uh, yeah, I watched that before I really knew how to appreciate Argento. So, yeah, I, I might try at some point to watch it again and be able to better judge. But as it is, I just, I don't remember enough. But, but yeah, um... You know, ultimately, she was cast in part for her appearance, but the, the, um, let's see. Now, yeah, you know, um, and I, yeah, I, I don't think they, necessarily thought that they were, you know, spending her time, you know, well there, but I can understand, I, I don't think she was particularly established when she appeared in this, and, you know, thankfully today, you know, everybody knows who Jennifer Connelly is, so, yeah, you know, she was willing to take a, a job that wasn't necessarily most fulfilling, in order to, um, you know, to, to boost her, her status. While filming, Bill Campbell and Jennifer Connelly began a romance. They later became engaged, but broke the engagement off in 1996, after having been together for five years. And you can tell, they, they have, uh, you know, uh, serious chemistry. So, uh, yeah, a critic quote, she was still at that weird stage in some of her early roles where she was incredibly stiff and never really seemed to gel with the mood of the rest of the movie. I think her role as Cliff's girlfriend Jenny called for someone with a bit more nerve and personality beyond annoyed girlfriend, but the script can take the hit for some of that, though. Yeah, per... Yeah, yeah, I suppose. There's, there's some truth to that, but I still thought she, you know, yeah, I liked her, her character. Now, Alan Arkin plays PV, a PV Peabody, and yeah, you know it's it's a the kind of role he can do in his sleep. But yeah, he's he's charming in it, and you do buy that he and Cliff, you know, they're they're a little they go a little hard on each other sometimes. But they they also both know they can take it. You know, it's not they're not trying to tear each other down. They're based, you know, it's that thing of like. For a lot of men to be able to express positive feelings for another man without fearing that they are gay or per will be perceived to be gay, as if there's anything wrong with that, they will, you know, they, they don't just say, you're doing a good job. They'll say stuff like, you know, Ugh, this is the worst I've ever seen you do, implying that you know, they've seen you do better, th that kind of thing. Th that's not a line from this movie, but as an example. 
and Timothy Dalton plays Neville Sinclair, a former Bond actor. He is so much fun in this and Looney Tunes back in action. And yeah, just the way that he... Uh, yeah, it, um, basically, Neville Sinclair is supposed to be... I gotta look up, because I don't remember his name. Yeah, it's supposed to be Errol Flynn, basically. Which, yeah, Neville Sinclair, Errol Flynn, it's... Yeah. And the the... Yeah, so the movie is set in 1938, and they are in the middle of filming something, and it is clearly supposed to be The Adventures of Robin Hood, you know, and, and yeah, um, it is, you know, they, they have to give it a different title and, and play around a little bit, but it's very clearly that, and just clearly the people making this movie, very much including Timothy Dalton, love doing that like like Timothy Dalton is having the time of his life playing this fictionalized version of Errol Flynn and he absolutely nails it too he must have watched I mean I guess based on his Timothy Dalton's age he might have watched some Errol Flynn movies when he was young and I could imagine him like really um yeah, getting getting into and and wanting to play the character. He he looks like it's been his lifelong ambition. And Terry O'Quinn plays Howard Hughes, and yeah, um, he does a really great job. And you know, I I primarily know him from Lost and Alias, but I've seen a couple. You know, he's in um, that movie. I can't believe I'm blanking on the. Um, it has Richard Gere, and. It is called, ah, uh, well, I know when it came out, so I can find it pretty quickly. Uh, Primal Fear. He's, yeah, he's good in that. And, let's see, yeah, uh, Ed Lauder and James Handy play FBI agents, and they really nail, like, you, you get the sense these are these are guys who are used to ah they gotta spend a lot of time behind a desk and they're really glad to be out in the field and the the way that they interact with with others just yeah Paul Sorvino plays Eddie Valentine and he is just I mean again Paul Sorvino can play a mobster in his sleep. So I really appreciate that he decided to not just sleepwalk through this movie. And he is also, like, his character is more interesting than you might at first think. And, yeah, he, he absolutely nails it. And John Polito, R.I.P., plays Otis Bigelow. He's always fun in genre movies. I love him in The Crow. Could you put me up for the night? And the... Yeah... He's he's great here. Like he is I'm not sure that he's actually supposed to be like someone who actually like uh, what's the word? He's not really supposed to be a penny pincher, but he's just like he yeah, he's worried about losing money basically and yeah, it's it's quite fun. And Clint Howard. Wow, I don't remember him appearing playing Mark. Huh, I, I must have missed that. And Tiny Ron Taylor, R.I.P., plays Lothar. And, you know, this guy had such a strong presence, and he is great here. Like, the poor guy is buried beneath these... Uh, prosthetics and he still does a really like basically the only thing we can see of his real face are his eyes and yeah he he gets a lot across through just his eyes and his physical like his body language like just i i don't really want to give away exactly what he does but just you'll know when you see the the kind of just yeah 
and let's see. Yeah, and, and Clark Gable and W.C. Fields make cameo appearances in this, and just, yeah, um, they really are great as the, 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 uh, the actors are very convincing as them, rather. And that brings, yeah, so, as you can maybe tell, this is not the most diverse casted movie. You know, other than just plain white, there are some Italians and, you know, I am almost certain, but I'm going to look it up to make sure. Um, hmm, is that... Oh, I, wait, okay, now I'm not quite sure if, uh, hmm, okay, I, I'm not going to spend forever on this, I just got to make sure. Um, okay, yeah, yeah. As far as I can tell, he was white. He was not the African-American actor who has a slightly similar name. But, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a pretty white dude heavy movie. Um, but I would say, I mean, the female characters, they do get some definition. And some of them get moments where they are able to do something very impressive uh, you know but but yeah it's and and yes i know you know oh 1938 hollywood there wasn't a lot of diversity you know you they could have gone with colorblind casting and they chose not to and that is also you know that fairly typical for for 1990s hollywood uh one critic's claim uh, feels that the chemistry between characters isn't good enough, I disagree. But, yeah, some people feel that way. And, yeah, so the dialogue is great. There are 33 entries in the IMDb quote section. All of them are good. And, like, the characters in this really talk befitting the, the period, you know, old-timey lingo and dialects. And, you know, one of the... Yeah, one of the one of the characters is is punched by a pilot, and his you know yeah some someone that he considers like a friend or, or something basically doesn't think that they should do anything about that, and so he says, and this is verbatim, that flyboy hangs on my kisser and you let him waltz, and at one point you know instead of saying. Instead of saying something like, what are you, nuts? The, the character says, are your eyes painted on? And that's another thing that some people really struggled with. And I, I get, you know, yeah. Still, I don't think it makes sense to give it a negative view. Just point out, you know, it's, it's fine to state it and say, you know, for sure, some people are not going to be able to get into this movie because it is so much of a love letter to a time that a huge amount of the audience have never experienced personally. You know, it basically, like, you know, I mean, I mean yeah, I, I mentioned that, you know, in this movie they are shooting a fake version of 1938's The Adventures of Robin Hood. I love that movie. It's... 
yeah, it's my favorite Robin Hood movie. You know, I'm not saying it's completely perfect, and there's definitely some things that, you know, have aged. <sighs> yeah. C certain things in that movie are very different from the way we expect them to be today. For example, something like the fencing choreography. You know, it's it's nothing like what we expect in much more recent movies, you know. But, yeah, it, it, that movie really captures Robin Hood, and this movie really captures 1938 Hollywood. And if that appeals to you, then I think there's a good chance you're going to really like this movie. But if it doesn't, a, yeah, a huge amount of the, of the audience, of, of the people who actually watch this movie, are not at all, you know, um, yeah. Are, are not going to be expecting or used to that kind of thing. And then it, you know, I, th I think at that point it may be the things that I mentioned other critics were bothered by maybe really, really get to you if you're not already in love with the movie. So, that's right. The, the cinematography was handled by Hiro Narita. So there is some diversity behind the camera at least. And let's see, yeah, so, so 25 DP credits for theatrical movies. Now, the ones I have watched are Fortress 2 Reentry, the original Hocus Pocus, Star Wars 6, The Undiscovered Country, and Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. So, yeah, the... Um, Fortress 2 is not particularly, but but the other three are fairly, yeah. And, yeah, so, yeah, briefly, you know, worst to best, I love all except Fortress 2. Fortress 2, Hocus Pocus, Star Trek 6, and Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. And for sure, there's some really... Like, the cinematography in this movie is really, really solid. Um, there are a lot of shots where it has to keep up with the the Rocketeer because he does fly very fast. And then there are some scenes where the Rocketeer is... You know, there's a... Yeah, there are times where he's not necessarily himself moving very fast, but they are in a very dangerous area and, and where something is moving fast. And yeah, the cinematography does a really, really great job. I was never confused as to the geography or any kind of, Like, if you have a character who's struggling to control a jetpack, it is extremely important that we, the audience, understand how... Like... Does he have to turn, like, right this second? Or does he have, like, a couple more seconds before he has to turn to make sure he doesn't fly directly into something? You know, and, yeah, the movie, I was never unsure of how close he is to just flying into something. And this was edited by Arthur Schmidt, who has 26 theatrical editing credits and the ones that I have watched are the first Pirates of the Caribbean, The, the Curse of the Black Pearl, Chain Reaction, Ameri Adam's Family Values, The Last of the Mohicans, Death Becomes Her, all through the, the Back to the Future trilogy, and Who Framed Roger Rabbit. He is very, very talented. So, yeah. Ranking those, worst to best, I love them all. Chain Reaction, Adam's Family Values, The Last of the Mohicans, Death Becomes Her, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, Back to the Future 3 and 1, and then 2, and let's see, yeah, and, and then Pirates of the Caribbean. Right, um, worst to best editing, I mean. Um, so, so yeah, uh, very, very talented, and he absolutely brings his talent to this. You know, he... The, the um, there are a lot of of times where the the um, 
some of this is also down to, to the, the script. But since the plot, you know, there are a number of moving parts. I, I'm not sure I would necessarily call it complex, but there are a lot. There, there are a bunch of different characters you have to keep track of. And basically the editing has to make sure that there's never a huge chunk of movie that just does not have, or at the very least reference, the, the major characters. Because that could risk the audience forgetting that something like you don't really want an audience member to react to seeing a character with I forgot they were still in the movie you know that's not ideal and he does a really solid job and and frequently uh, uh, yeah on, on multiple occasions it will like characters will talk about we have to get to there and then it'll cut to there and then you know maybe five minutes later those characters show up, so we're not confused as to how that, you know, and because it cuts directly from them talking about going there to the place, we are waiting in anticipation for them to arrive and for things to get, you know, very, you know, it, it could get very dangerous. And yeah, it's it's very classic filmmaking stuff, you know, just, yeah. If you if you if you have something where it could be difficult to, to follow, it doesn't have to be. There are plenty of movies that don't do this and don't need to do it. But with this, you really do have that the the yeah, they're they're going it it will cut between the the interest you know, and, and yeah, maybe maybe after, you know, so first we'll see the, the people who saying, oh, we, we got to get to there. Then we'll see the place, and then a couple of minutes later, they arrive. And then it might cut to a third person who is being told, did you hear what's going on at the place? And then they head out to get there as well, and we cut back to the place. And, you know, so, so it keeps, yeah. Um, yeah, honestly, I would say... Yeah, I think the editing in this is even better than Back to the Future 2, second only to the Pirates of the Caribbean, The Curse of the Black Pearl. And that brings us to the budget. Yeah, 35, it's, it's estimated 35 million, yeah, 35 to 40 million dollars, and the American box office was... Uh, hold on. Is this... Uh, yeah, yeah. The the box office was 46.7 million. Now, back then they didn't need to make... You know, today it's like, oh, you gotta make back twice the budget and marketing and all this. But it was still... Uh, that, that means it was a box office bomb. And again, like... When people found out that this ran in theaters, like... A lot of people chose Terminator 2, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, or Robin Hood, you know, and, and if there's one of these movies that they would go back and watch a second time, you know, the people, you know, obviously some people did watch this movie or it wouldn't have made $46.7 million, but a lot of the people who watched this, I'm not sure if they were necessarily interested in watching it again, you know, and yeah, like I'm... Almost definitely. I, I it's, yeah, I'm gonna be watching this again. But yeah, if you're not, you know, it is it is kind of a niche thing. And yeah, I think they they hoped that it would be interesting enough to people that they would be fine with it being niche, you know, and and compelling enough. And and there's this you got to balance niche. You can if it's not. If it, if it hits the sweet spot, the niche can be super interesting. You know, it's like, okay, I have never seen something like that before. I gotta see this, you know. And this might have been a little too niche. There might have been a, a few too many things about it that were so different that just, you know, like... I wouldn't have loved it as much if not for the fact that it features a character that's, you know, 1938 Errol Flynn, and we see him, like, they did a really good job recreating this thing of, like, 
I, I know exactly what scenes in 1938's The Adventures of Robin Hood they were, because you see a little of it being filmed. I might have already mentioned that. And, and yeah, like, I... It, it lo they, they recreated it lovingly. This is a love letter to that period of Hollywood and those serials and such. And, yeah, you know, the, yeah. The, the, you know, Star Wars started in 1977, and I'm really quickly going to look up. I don't offhand know, but the first Indiana Jones... Uh, 81, it looks like. That was the right time for this kind of... Because those movies are also love letters to these serials. Yeah, 1981. 1991, that might have been too late for this kind of thing. And, yeah. Let's see. You know, the, yeah, the, the comic, 1982, that was, that was right in that sweet spot for when it could come out. Now, uh, let's see, yeah, so this was filmed some in studio, some on location, Hollywood, and, uh, let's see, yeah, and it does, you know, it really feels like when it was the, the, yeah, uh, right, there's some, yeah, the sets, just this gorgeous art deco, like, I, I want to go there, you know, I, I, yeah, um, yeah, and, and, yeah, so, according to IMDb Trivia, Dave Stevens, the writer-artist of the original graphic novel, gave the film's production designer, Jim Bazell, and his two art directors his entire reference library pertaining to the Rocketeer at that time period, including blueprints for hangers and bleachers, schematics for building the autogyro, photos and drawings of the Bulldog Cafe, the uniforms for the air circus staff, and contacts for locating the vintage aircraft that were to be used. Stevens remembers that they literally just took the reference and built the sets. And just, it's amazing. Just, yeah, it, it looks so good. And, yeah, the costumes also really fit the, the time period. Like, basically, no one and nothing really feels out of place in this. Everything goes to it's it's so carefully you know yeah every single so the the action the, this is really more of an action adventure than an outright action movie and you know at the end of the day that is you know joe johnston is really good at this kind of you know one of the things that some people really don't like about the first captain america movie is that it is basically an action adventure movie you know it is in some ways closer to an indiana jones movie you know than a yeah traditional action movie and let's see yeah you know jumanji action adventure page master action adventure honey i shrunk the kids yeah you know and i think that might also be something that that bothered some you know Ah, what's the word? Uh, present day viewers of of this, and even in 1991, it was kind of a gamble to to make. But yeah, um, you know, there are there's some there's some fighting, there's some chasing and shooting, and yeah, it's it's very. I've I personally found it to be quite tense, and then sometimes it goes for for just being being silly and and not really. Um, you know, there, there are times where he will crash the, the jetpack into something where you're, like, laughing at it more than being scared that he's going to get hurt. And, yeah, the, the score was composed by James Horner, R.I.P. And, yeah, um, I... I I'm quite a fan of his, and he does really well. He did really well here as well. And, yeah, the... Oh, yeah, he, he composed for the Page Master as well. And Jumanji. So, yeah, the, the two of them liked working together back when Horner was still alive. So, yeah, he, he really, like, um, the, the music fits the... Let's see. Did I... Yeah, 
you know, it, it fits the, the time period, well, and, and the feel. And there's both original score and licensed music. And let's see. Right, so the, um, according to IMDb Trivia, some of the music in Titanic from 1997, which was released six years later, is very reminiscent of the score. James Horner wrote the score for both movies. And that's also, uh, let's see. Yeah, so some critic quotes. Playful score, one of Horner's all-time best scores. One of James Horner's best scores, one of the least borrowed from previous scores or reprised in later scores. Alias was Star Trek II Redux. Titanic was Braveheart Redux. I like Horner, but his borrowings bug the heck out of me. And yeah, it is It is very, very... Yeah. Now, the sound design is quite good. Uh, let's see. The... the um, um, yeah. Jetpacks do not exist in the real world. As fun as it would be, we we have to settle for the, the movies and the video games and such. But this does... Yeah, the, you know, this has to make us believe that that jetpack is real. That, that we're... And, and sound is an important part of that, and they really nail it. Like, it really felt like the... the yeah. Like, it actually is what a 1938 jetpack, not a modern jetpack, would sound like. And, yeah, so the, the pacing... The, the, I've, yeah, I already mentioned that the movie doesn't really waste any time. I, I'm not sure that it's accurate necessarily to uh, the, the, um, oh, right, ah, yeah, this was an editing thing. Uh, there's some really great smash cuts where it'll go from, from one thing to another to great effect. Um, some really dramatic ones, but but yeah, the I, I suppose I can't really call it a fast-paced movie, but it's it's not really slow, and the movie never like there's always something going on. It's just it, it the plot doesn't take off as much or as fast as some critics would like to would like it to. But yeah, it is an hour and 44 and a half minutes long without end credits, 48 and a half long with them. There's no post credit scene, uh, you know, the, like the credits, like there's some good music playing over them. So you might, you know, have it on the background, but it's not something you have to sit still for. And I, I'm going to very quickly find... So I like to say, you know, how how much of it should you give? To, you know, now that it's on streaming, you can just it, you can very easily, you know, just turn it off without really. Yeah, I would say about. Uh, let's see. Yeah, but basically the first half hour, if half an hour into the movie, if you don't care about seeing, you know, see, yeah, seeing what happens with the elements that you've already seen, yeah, you, you can go ahead and turn it off. You're not, I, I don't think anything after that is going to, um, what's it called, um, Nothing later in the film is necessarily going to change your mind. Except the, the a twist near the end, maybe. But if you're not already interested, the, the twist itself is not going to be enough. So, yeah, uh, I would say the best elements. Uh, I think it's great that it has something for everyone to enjoy. It's great that the... Um, just the feel, the way it recreates, you know, uh, the, the, yeah. Actually, yeah, I, I mentioned earlier some of the groups that would enjoy this. I think people, if you show this to someone who was alive in 38 or at least, you know, not too much, you know, or, or the 40s at least, I think they could really, they would really love seeing it again, you know. 
Now, the worst aspect is probably that if you don't already want to watch it, it doesn't really sell itself. It's not a movie that really, you know, and, and yeah, as an example, you know, that's something the MCU, you know, more recently they've tried to to really get extremely specific and, and basically be for very specific audiences. And I love that early on. And, and some of this I do think was a good idea, especially early on they tended to work to make sure that there was something that would really, you know, if you think back to the the start of the Phase 1 MCU movies, like, they would tend to show something in the opening minutes that they would hope you would want to stick around to see, you know, okay, I gotta know more about these characters in this world, and this movie, like, if you aren't already into it, like, there's action very early on, but if you're not into the the feel and the, you know, it's it's not a it's not the kind of action scene that just, you know, it, yeah, again, um, Batman 1989, the opening of that movie sells you on it. Like, if you don't want to watch more after the opening scene, you know, like. You're, you're just not in the audience group, basically. And the audience for it was huge at the time. You know, Batman was very popular with teens who knew something beyond the, the old TV show. But yeah. Um, yeah, so the worst thing, according to others, is the lack of chemistry between leads, which, yeah, I don't think... you know, Right, right yeah. I don't think it's... I, I don't think the movie is worse for not being good at selling itself. I think it basically just came out at the wrong time, and that's, you know, and I don't, I don't really agree that there's no chemistry between the leads. I, I do think if it were, you know, yeah, if it's something you find is is true of, you know, you you agree with that while watching it, yeah, it's definitely gonna bother you. It's definitely gonna be a problem for the movie. Uh, the, I was most worried that the the kind of corny cheesy thing would really bother me. You know, I am I am not the biggest fan of the 1972 Superman movie, but that yeah, I think what this has that that doesn't. I'm I'm not saying this is necessarily the better of the two movies. What this has that that doesn't is that it recreates a period that I think was really really fascinating. It's it's very interesting to see old Hollywood. You know, such as. Cause, cause, like Hollywood, you know, they. Uh, I mean, okay, 1938, they were making movies. It's not like right after film was invented, but it was. They were making movies in a very different way than today. And and I, I just, I think there's something, there's stuff to really appreciate about that. So yeah, um, yeah, the movie is corny and cheesy, but if you get into it, it's not gonna bother you. I, in in my opinion. And, yeah, you know, the thing I was most looking forward to about this movie was another Joe Johnston-helmed fantastic concept, especially a period piece. And, yeah, the movie exceeded my expectations. I can hardly believe now that actually there was a time when I wasn't completely sold on watching this movie. That seems like a lifetime ago now, but, yeah. And, yeah, the trailers do give too much away, but they do also give you a good idea of what the movie is like. And if you can't stomach the original trailer, the modern trailer also gives you a good idea of what the movie's like. And the cover and poster don't give too much away and give you an okay idea of... It, it, yeah, you know, if you look at the poster or, or cover, you are going to, like... It's either going to appeal to you or it isn't. And... It, it it has a very strong effect. Yeah, some people are going to look at it and think, that's ridiculous, I don't want to watch this. And, yeah, some of us are going to be like, oh, they did the thing with the thing. Oh, wow, I got to see this. And, yeah. And that's also, I think, if they made... If, you know, if, if it was made today, especially if it was part of the MCU, they would definitely tone down aspects of the look. I mean, if you if you think about it, you know, what is the Iron Man suit if not, you know, a jetpack with more than just the jetpack, you know, and they made sure that it looked really sleek. Like, if you look at the original comics art, it, actually, yeah, if you watch Iron Man 1, that bulky thing he walks in some of the time, that's what 
it looked like in the original comics. You you can Google. You don't have to take my word for it. Google it. And yeah, they wisely did not keep him in that for the entire movie, even though, yeah, that you know some movies do that kind of thing. And just yeah. So when I searched here on YouTube, I found eight clips, five trailers, including fan ones, five TV spots, four tributes, thirteen review analysis. So yeah, uh, not not something hugely talked about. And I think it deserves more than that. Yeah, so on Rotten Tomatoes, this has a 66% on the tomato meter based on 65 reviews, 43 of them fresh, and a 65% audience score based on over 50,000 ratings. And the average critic rating was 6.20 out of 10. And the average user rating was 3.6 out of 5 and anything above 3.5 adds to the overall you know so yeah 65 percent of the people who voted gave it 3.5 or higher and the consensus an action pack if anachronistic and yeah anachron anachronistic look back at pulp matinee serials the rocketeer may ring hollow with viewers expecting more than simple fun and g whiz special effects but it is fresh and on Metacritic, it has a score of 61 out of 100, based on 8 credit reviews and uh, 7.5 out of 10 from users based on 31 ratings. So, yeah, does vary some. And there's only 179 user reviews on IMDb. Uh, I read all of them. Normally, I only read the top voted 100, but when there's that few. And, yeah, so I think these are the top... 100 yeah so the 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 review the user reviews voted most useful one is a one out of ten two two out of ten two is a three out of ten there is eight four out of tens six fives eight sixes 17 sevens 23 eights 13 nines and 23 tens so that is fairly positive uh, you know more people like the reviews that were positive than the ones that were not. And yeah, this won one award and were, was nominated for six total. So let's see, it was nominated for a Saturn Award for the 20th Anniversary Edition release. And it won the Saturn Award for Best Costumes. Yeah, that does make a lot of sense. And it was nominated for Saturn Award for Best Science Fiction Film, Best Supporting Actress for Jennifer Connelly, Best Special Effects, Ken Ralston and ILM. It was nominated for Hugo Awards, Best Dramatic Presentation. Uh, let's see, yeah, Joe Johnson, Daniel Wilson, Paul DeMeo, and William Deere, and Dave Stevens. And it was nominated for a Satellite Award for the 20th Anniversary Blu-ray Disc. And on IMDb, it has a 6.5 out of 10 based on 57,509 IMDb user votes. So 26.6 gave it 7, 25 gave it 6, uh, 15 gave it 8, 12 gave it 5, uh, 6.9 gave it 10, 5.7 gave it 9, 4.7 gave it 4. 2% gave it 3, and 1% gave it 2, 1.1% gave it 1. I gotta say, I cannot understand giving it I th anything less than a 5, really. Just the, the talent on display and how well at least most of it works. Now, um, right, that brings us to the special effects. Often when someone flies with a jetpack, it interacts with the environment, and they use practical effects to this, to do this. For example, someone will fly very close to hanging laundry, blowing all the laundry, and then we realize he's now flying with a sheet covering his face. And, covering his face. and obviously this is also something we can laugh at, slapstick. Thus, though the flying effects are not as convincing today, they don't just rely on the spectacle. And let's see. Um, let's see. 
Yeah, so one critic said, following the Superman movies, you'll believe a man can fly with grainy back pro projection or a thick matte line around him. This was the first of a new generation of movies where a man flying looked like a man flying and not a special effect. And yeah, he doesn't think that there was enough of the jetpack action. And yeah, I, I think that there's just, there are so many other things about the movie like, I guess, let's say that you cut the cast in half. Not with a saw, I mean, you know. Uh, remove them from the movie, and not with a saw. Um, let's see. Uh, if if the romance wasn't there, and if the art deco, if the, if the costume weren't so... Then I would also be like, there's too little flying, but... There's not much flying, for sure. The, and, and a lot of people are going to feel there's it's too little, and... and the movie was partially sold on him flying, so, yeah. And, yeah, you know, um, Terminator 2 came out the same year. Like, that movie, the effects are so much. Like, you can watch that movie today. I, I watched it recently since Avatar 2 just came out, and I watched any James Cameron that I have access to, you know. So, uh, yeah, um... The special effects in that movie are still amazing. You can still watch, you know, yeah, you can watch it today and some of it really, really holds up. And the little bit that doesn't tends to only, it tends to go by so quickly, you know. So, yeah, uh, this movie wasn't really, you know, there for spectacle so much. And I get why a lot of people had expected that kind of thing. You know, yeah, for sure. Like, if you want a comic book adaptation movie that is about a hero this is just not going to deliver as much you know there's there's much more batman in the 89 batman there's more of the turtles than than the jetpack and you know there's more of the turtles in the first movie than there is of the jetpack flying in this um much more terminator action terminator so, so yeah um i i completely understand why it didn't um, right, and there's some really, really great stunts. Like, obviously, some of the time, the, the flying is not, like, l literally, but some of the time, there's clearly a real person, like, you know, hopefully not risking his life, but doing something s stunt-wise very impressive. That brings us to... All right. Huh. I'll... Yeah, I'll, I'll, there'll be link at, at least one link in the description box to something compelling that also is about this review and and that kind of thing. So, uh, yeah, you know, uh, right. Some places this is on Apple TV, but otherwise it's on Disney Plus. And it doesn't have any special features, but, you know, if you're into, if you like this movie, there's a good chance you're going to like the first Captain America movie. And, yeah, you know, they have all of the, you know, yeah, like I mentioned, it has some, some very Disney qualities, you know, and, yeah, Disney Plus, unsurprisingly, has, you know, I'm not sure there's very much Disney that they don't have. That's either, like, film, show, or, or short. You know, I, I don't know. Do, did they eventually show the... I, f I forget if they did eventually put up the ones that, like... Did I, f I feel like I heard that they temporarily removed the ones that were, like, really racially insensitive at the time and just plain racist today, but yeah. Yes, this, I, I rate this 8 prototype jetpack carried action adventures out of 10. I am definitely going to be watching this movie again. I, I wouldn't rule out just putting it on as soon as I stop recording this video, honestly. Uh, let's see. The um, Yes, that brings us to... Yeah. Um... So, worst to best of the movies I've watched that are directed by Joe Johnston, 
The Wolfman, The Page Master, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, The Rocketeer, Jumanji, and Captain America the First Avenger. And worst to best of similar movies, Sky Captain, Indiana Jones 2, The Rocketeer, Batman 89, Iron Man 1, The Shadow, and Dark Man. And I think that is it for the... Yeah, so... This is where I would usually go into notes taken while watching, but all of those I put in the... Almost all of them I put in the review itself. There's... Just a couple. I'm gonna go ahead and just put them in the in the final notes section. So, yes, that means we are getting into spoilers. The rest of the video will have spoilers. I will discuss the ending. So, yeah, don't don't rob yourself of the of the chance to watch this without knowing. Notes taken before watching. Now, uh, let's see. Here we go. So, yes, starting with some IMDb trivia. During the fight scene on board the Zeppelin, Cliff says to Neville, Where's your stuntman now, Sinclair? To which Neville replies, I do my own stunts. This line is in reference to Timothy Dalton's time as James Bond, since he is known for being the only Bond actor to perform most of his own stunts. Disney had a special mechanism built especially for this film called the Shaky Cam. It was designed to be the exact opposite of the Steady Cam. Yeah, back when Shaky Cam. Yeah, today there's too much Shaky Cam. It can be really good though. That is to introduce vibrations into the picture. This was used in the scenes filmed inside the Zeppelin to give the impression of the power of the engines. When the movie went to video, the effect didn't transfer too well and was therefore steadied. When Eddie Valentine and his gang learn that Neville Sinclair is a Nazi, they quit working for him and join up with the FBI agents against the Nazi thugs hidden in the shadows. This reflects the attitude of real-life American gangsters during this era, in that they did not like fascism, particularly because Benito Mussolini persecuted the Sicilian families back in the old country, nor did any Jewish mobsters like Adolf Hitler. In fact, organized crime was one of the biggest allies the American government and law enforcement had when it came to rooting out Nazi spies and collaborators. And, yeah, so, um, some critic quotes. One, one says, that, you know, the, the Nazi plan doesn't make that much sense when you think about it. How would Nazis having jetpacks lead to world domination? I mean, they got kind of close without them. I, I, yeah. Anyway, um, the plot was so superficial and generic that it could indeed have been plucked from a 1930s Saturday matinee serial. The concept of a Nazi takeover of America using Howard Hughes' jetpack device seemed, seemed like an afterthought. Hmm. Why were there even Nazis in this other than a that a posse of well-dressed mafiosi didn't exactly present a credible menace. The answer, of course, is that you can inject Nazis into anything and the plot will automatically become sexier. There's really nothing wrong with this. Uh, yeah, Indiana Jones films and Disney's own Bedknobs and Broomsticks had also served up Nazis for a family audience. The problem here is that, unlike in other films, the Nazis here seem more like a spice than an essential ingredient. Even worse, we are never offered any justification for why a wealthy and personal actor like Neville Sinclair would ever be attracted to Nazi ideology. And, yeah, I, I think they might have been worried. They, they didn't want to try to make a case for Nazism. And, and for sure, like, throughout this movie, yeah, hoping that you already watched it as well. You know, yeah, Nazis are never presented as anything other than a threat. Um, and they're, they're definitely, um, what's the word? Like, othered, you know. The, I don't think a single line of German is, is actually subtitled into English. You know, and they, they betray each other, and they're just really unpleasant. Just, yeah. A lot of the movie is too child-friendly for adults, but the ending is too dark for kids. Today, heroes are damaged. Cliff isn't. For some, it's a bug. For others, a feature. And, yeah, I totally understand why why people wouldn't... Yeah, and, and yeah, I, I think it works. Um... Now, in real life, Errol Flynn was not a Nazi, but he did do some awful things, so... Yeah, I'm not hugely against the... the, the yeah. Now, uh, let's see. 
Yeah, so the the I appreciate that Jenny, you know, after she's captured, she doesn't manage to escape, but she does find out proof that um I can't believe I'm blanking on his name. Um she does realize that the the Neville is a Nazi. And later on when the, which I, I really like the, the tension when, when, you know, the handover Jenny for the, the rocket, you know, in, in general, the entire scene, but the, it's really great when, you know, basically Eddie Valentine is, he's okay with working, you know, he's okay with the hostage shake and all of this, but Cliff tell, you know, asks him, are you, you know, how does it feel to be working with a Nazi? You know, and Eddie, you know, he, he doesn't like that idea, but he's gonna, you know, he's not like, okay, can he really believe this one guy's word? So, so he turns to, to Neville and says, you know, what, what is he talking about? You know, just could, could there be, and then Jenny chimes in with explain the secret room, the German radio and the, the swastika. And, you know, it's like. Okay, that's either 100% true or she is one heck of an... In it, it, that's, that's incredible improvisation. Like, if she just heard Cliff say that Neville is actually a Nazi and she just, just immediately, without any, like, without skipping a beat, just immediately, okay, secret room, not uh, German radio, swastika. You know, that's just, like... And it's also... It's just, yeah, it's it's way too detailed to just be like, you know, this, uh, um, that, I forget where I heard it, but someone said, if you're going to lie, lie, lie with great detail, you know, that, that's much more convincing than just, yeah, and she seems completely convinced that what she's saying is true, you know, um, I, I guess, I, I'm not sure if Eddie knows that she is an actress, but certainly, like, He's not going to recognize, you know, she's not Garbo. So, yeah, uh, at, at the time, you know, there's, it's possible that she will become a great actress later on. But, yeah, um, so, so that, that was really great. So, so you know, it's not, it's not that there's nothing when the, the, oh, right, I want to briefly, yeah. The first time we see um, Cliff and the first time we see Jenny, both of them are kissing their fingers and then putting their fingers on the lips of a picture they have of the other. And that tells us, you know, both that they care for each other and, and are thinking about each other a lot. That picture is later, you know, later allows... The, the picture of, of Cliff has both of them and, there's, and that picture is also hanging, I think guess in the in the um diner the the big dog diner big bulldog diner something like that and that's how you know so so one of the mafiosi is just about to to really you know he he basically realizes oh this is cliff we already have him and then cliff fights his way out and the picture of jenny he makes sure to always put it in the plane he's gonna fly so when the mafiosi you know look everywhere in, in the in the hangar, they find that picture and they're like, she's you know if we find her we'll find the pilot because they don't know what the pilot looks like, and they don't know because he's not a celebrity or anything, and they don't know that the, um, yeah they they don't know where the um, the um, yeah yeah let's see when they go to the hangar. They, the, the, I think at that time the jetpack is with PV and he doesn't live in the hangar. He rents the hangar to, to use for, so, so yeah. But yeah, ultimately it is frustrating that Jenny doesn't really get very much to do in this movie and is captured. I wish they either had her free herself or be so capable they couldn't kidnap her at all. If that was too out of the subgenre, have her hide so they don't find her. Instead of going to rescue her, Cliff goes to prevent them from kidnapping her because they got so close. As it is, you know, if they done, if she done as Cliff the man told her, she wouldn't have been kidnapped, thus sending that negative message that women should always listen to men. So let's see. Um, uh, 
Um, yeah, uh, once again, I, I am not, I don't take any pleasure in speaking ill of the dead, unless, you know, a couple of weeks ago I did it for, um, let's see, I can't believe I'm blanking on his name. His name was, right, Rush Limbaugh. I, yeah, I, I did indeed very intentionally speak ill of Rush Limbaugh. I suppose what I should say is I don't like speaking ill of dead human beings. So, it's only because the following just, it, it bothered me too much to not bring it up. So, spoilers for the first collection book of the comic. Keeping in mind, some of this is not the same as the movie. So, if you still want to read the... Uh, oh, is that it? Oh, actually, yeah, yeah. If you do not want to know what's in the book that isn't in the movie, skip until you see me lower my index finger. So, I can't rule out that something in one of the later books addresses this, retcons this, but in the first collection, Betty is characterized as basically not faithful to... Oh, right, in the comics, she's Betty, not Jenny. Yeah, she thinks to herself that she spends more time with him than with anyone else, but she does agree to go to Europe with Marco, who takes nude photos of her professionally. She doesn't even think there's anything wrong with doing this. She thinks to herself that men must just be less intelligent than women since they can't understand this kind of behavior. In the film, Jenny does go on a date with, uh, you know, Neville Sinclair, but this could help her career, and a date doesn't mean sex. Going to Europe with an attractive person that you are working for strongly implies it. Cliff is depicted as faithful to her, but he thinks that she only stay, she'll only stay if he makes more money, something that she isn't seen to correct, so seemingly she agrees with that version of it. Both of them bicker when together. She thinks he takes too many risks. He thinks she worries too much. At one point, he sends potentially dangerous men to her address and, real and laughs when he realizes that the dangerous men found her naked being photographed. She then sends them to him. In both cases, this could easily have led to injury, possibly even death. He does it because he's jealous, which is painted as funny. She does it to get revenge, which is painted as callous. Given that the character was based on a woman who did, in real life, pose for nude photos, it would appear that this is, in fact, the, her job for, you know, the, what she's known for so why does he think that she should stop she's the one making money and she doesn't seem to think there's anything wrong with this work he must have known when they started dating or he found out that she was doing it after she they started dating if the former maybe he has some sort of moral objection to what she's doing in which case he can go right to heck it is none of his business it isn't actually cheating on him or anything and this is especially gross, considering that, as others have pointed out, writer and artist Dave Stevens did this as a self-insert. Cliff looks like him, so he wrote a story in which he is dating this nude model, but he doesn't want her to keep doing it. Just find someone else to date. Let's see. And, yeah, you know, if she started doing it after they started dating, even though he objected, then it seems like she doesn't really respect his opinion on the matter. In which case, yeah, you shouldn't be together. Now, let's see. Right, and according to Wikipedia, after discovering that the retired page was still alive and lived nearby, Stevens became friends with her, providing both personal assistance and helping to arrange financial compensation to her from various publishers for the use of her image and reprints of her many glamour and pinup photos. So, you know, that, that's great. I'm really glad I... Yeah. He didn't have to put the what in he didn't have to put in the comic what he put in the comic. And they should probably not continue dating if they really have such low opinions of each other, treat each other so badly. I get that it was seen as romantic back then, but it's toxic. And you know, I will be put yeah, I'll put a link in the description box that goes more into the way that yeah. And let's see. Yeah. No more spoilers for the first collection book of the comic. So, yeah, you know, this movie does obviously ask the audience to believe some some wild concepts. In fact, I'm sure that young people today wouldn't even believe that Americans used to uniformly be against the Nazis. And that is it. So, hit me up in the comments. Let me know what is your favorite movie that is 
like this, you know, any movie that's like a period piece comic book adaptation or like inspired by serials. So, you know, Star Wars, Indiana Jones, that kind of thing. What do you, you know, do you think they should make a sequel? Um, and, you know, what do you think they should do for it? What what do you think they should should be different from this one? You know, personally, I would definitely say now that they've gotten the origin story out of the way, I think it would be great if a sequel had much more of the, um, yeah, of, of Cliff or whoever becomes the Rocketeer flying in the rocket. And I, I think it would be really cool if at least one of his enemies also had a piece of technology. Because at the, at the end of the day, you know, obviously we want to see Neville lose at the end of the movie because we know he's a Nazi. But he doesn't actually have, you know, he's, he's on a Zeppelin and Cliff gets onto the Zeppelin by flying. But, you know, that's basically, other, other than that, the technology of the rocket wasn't, you know, it's basically, it's a MacGuffin for them to fight over more than a tool for, you know, it's, it's not used that much in a way that really, you know, he'll, he'll use it every so often to escape. He saves that other pilot, which is great. That's also, I want to very briefly, I like that, you know, the other pilot didn't mean to be the one to break it to Jenny that the the plane is gone. You know, he, he doesn't, so so he feels bad. And Cliff tells him, you know, it's it's okay, I'm, I'm not upset with you. But that's why he tries to save Cliff's job by, you know, because what did the money man say? You know, John Polito, RIP, he said, be on time. I don't want you to be late. So when he's not on time... You know, the the other guy, I, f I forget what they called him exactly, but yeah, he's like, I gotta make it up to Cliff, this is my chance, you know, if I save his job, then, you know, yeah, I, I'm, I'm trying to make up for, you know, making his relationship with Jenny worse, so, yeah. So, if you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell like it's a Nazi, whether in 1938 or 2022, there should be a link to the, I'm not gonna... Don't punch Nazis in real life. It was a joke. There should be a link to my main channel page. One, two more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video for you to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie and one talking about my spoiler filled thoughts on the most recent episode of Willow. And recently, the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you want my videos like this, be on luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch my video next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording. I'll catch you next time. Just to briefly clarify, don't punch, not punch Nazis unless they're already, like, punching someone. But don't, don't start the fight, you know. So, yes. And this is actually my last video this week. I, I realize I've done more than usual. So, yes. Bye-bye.